Welcome everyone. This is super exciting because this I think is the first time that during alumni weekend, we are trying to bridge the gap between folks who are able to participate on campus in activities and find ways to connect with each other and with the school, even if we can't be on campus. So this is our uh, first ever entrepreneurship panel, and we have four very accomplished and fascinating women here today. We are so excited that you're all joining us. Um, welcome you to, if you know how to change your name, there are three little dots up at the top corner of your screen. If you'd like to add in your class year and where you're zooming in from, that would be fantastic. We have a number of questions for the panelists, but we would love to make this very conversational and interactive as well. So would certainly welcome, uh, there are some emojis and the raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen, or just give a little wave if you're on camera. And if you have a question, feel free to drop it in chat. I will be monitoring chat as well. So very excited to welcome you all here. So before we officially uh, kick off, I have a short poll that I'm going to launch to see who here is in the room. The poll's anonymous, just a couple questions to see who is a business owner, former business owner, interested in becoming a business owner. So I'm going to launch this poll and hopefully, can you all see it? Did that pop up on your screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So short poll, five questions, it's anonymous. Uh, first question, do you currently run or own your own business? Have you at any point in your life owned your own business? Are you thinking about starting a business? Are you currently part of any entrepreneurship groups? And would you be interested in joining an HB alumni entrepreneurship group? Well, that's fun. <laughs> To be created, we're sourcing, uh, we're sourcing ideas and, and interest at this point. So we'll just let a couple more folks participate and then I will close the poll and endeavor to share the results. And JJ, I'll let you know if I can see the results or not okay. in the poll. It's always a fun trick of Zoom. I'm going to close out the poll here. Can everybody see the results? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I can too. All right. So, do you currently run or own your own business? We've got about four business owners here. A couple folks are thinking about it. A uh, couple have owned their own business in the past. Five are starting about thinking or thinking about starting their own business. Um, a couple, two folks are in entrepreneurship groups, and we have a lot of interest in joining an HB alumni entre entrepreneurship group. So yay, and more info to be coming with that. But I will stop sharing the poll, and I will turn it over to JJ to introduce our esteemed panelists and kick off our discussion today. Okay. And I'm sharing the results of the poll, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, thank you, everybody, again. My name is JJ Wilson. Um, I was class of 97 at HB, and I'm this year's um, chair for Alumni Weekend here at HB. Um, I just want to start by introducing our panelists. Um, First, we have Alexandra Speck Slater, class of 91. Um, Alexandra is an award-winning journalist and writer who we received the Edward R. Murrow Award for Writing twice uh, when she worked as a reporter for NPR. Alex graduated from Columbia University with a degree in English literature and attended Northwestern University's um, Medell, Medell uh, Graduate School of Journalism. Since then, she's been an actress, 
a comedian on a house team at Upright Citizens Brigade, which uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, they perform comedy shows seven nights a week in New York City. Um, Alex was also a reporter for NPR, a creative writing teacher, a clinical research assistant, a fundraiser, and a marketing advisor. All of I which have problems, like I can't figure it out. <laughs> Join the club, <laughs> all of which paid little but sound good. Um, she's written two books, her first one titled Honor Girl, and she just released her newest book, Friends with Boats. Um, she splits her time between Boston and Cleveland with her husband their children, and three dogs. Um, we also have Courtney Mays, who is class of 2001. Courtney is the founder and principal stylist of the Parker Mays Collective, uh, which is, a uh, she's also a wardrobe stylist and an image consultant. After graduating from Michigan, she began her career in fashion working under Tracy Reese in New York City. Since starting her own business, she has amassed a list of celebrity clients, including professional athletes such as Kevin Love, Anthony Anderson, Chris Paul, and retired WNBA star <laughs> Sue Bird, just to name a few of them. Um, her work has graced the pages of Vogue, Vanity Fair, GQ, ESPN Magazine, and Hot Living, and The Zoe Report. Mays Courtney believes that honoring history and understanding social and political themes and celebrating positive body, body positivity, as well as underrepresented, underrepresented communities is imperative to pushing the boundaries and challenging the rule of fashion. She is passionate about supporting small and black owned businesses and strives to spread awareness and social change. We also joining us, we have Tyler Whitmore, class of 75. Um, in January 2022, Tyler Whitmore opened Tyler Whitmore Interiors, which is her unique furniture boutique specializing in refurbishing and upcycling furniture. The boutique features curated one-of-a-kind furniture pieces with an eye towards under, understated elegance. The new venture was a natural pivot from the successful home staging business she owned and operated since 2015. Her shop, which is located in Kensington, Maryland, also offers gallery space for featured artists and also sponsors women-owned business networking events. Um, and lastly, we have Reem Rahim Hassani, uh, class of 84. Um, Reem is the co-founder and chief brand officer of Numi Organic Tea. After earning her uh, BS in biomedical engineering from Case Western Reserve, Reem shifted her disciplines to pursue a diploma d'arte um, in drawing and painting from Lorenzo de' Medici Art Institute in Florence. Um, and then her master's in fine arts from John F. Kennedy University in the Department of Arts and Conscious Studies. Um, Reem currently oversees Noom's brand identity, including all packaging design, brand voice, and marketing. An artist by trade, Reem's original artwork inspired Noomi's brand vision. Reem is proud of the company's sustainable values, including its new plant-based compostable tea wrappers and Noomi Foundation's initiative, which include providing clean, safe drinking water, to 10,500 tea farming family members and delivering over 600,000 pounds of fresh produce to 7,500 low-income residents in Oakland, California during the pandemic. Reem has received numerous awards, including 2008 Professions World Awards Female Executive of the Year. She was also 2019 inductee into the Specialty Food Association's Hall of Fame. In 2019, she was one of progressive grocery top women in business. In 2020, she received Climate Collaboratives Award for Outstanding Influencer of the Year and the Next Year Gold Award in 2020, which recognizes the pinnacle of excellence in the na natural products industry. Reem continues to create art in her studio in California and is a proud mom and fluent in English, Italian, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, thank you all for joining us and um, let's get to our questions. Um, 
for those of you listening to the panel, we're going to reserve some time at the end for some questions. But if something pops into your mind, um, feel free to put it in the chat. And Elizabeth is going to um, sort of chime in with those questions as we go through them. Um, so to start off, um, this question is for all of the panelists. Um, what was the catalyst for starting your business? Um, so at what point in your life did you decide I'm going to quit whatever I'm doing and, and go out on my own and, and start a business? Um, Courtney, do you want to start? Sure. Um, my story is interesting because I never went from a corporate job or um, a, a big career to becoming an entrepreneur. I sort of always was a creative free spirit and uh, I think kind of took my parents for a loop because I started at Michigan as pre-med and was hoping to be a pediatrician. And I went to that first um, biochem class and said, no, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I knew like in my early 20s, late teens that I wanted to be a creative and it was important for me to um, own my own business. Maybe at that time, I didn't know what that meant. Um, but as I went through school, my, my degree is in art history. I knew how much I love the arts and I wanted to figure out a way to foster that love into um, something that was lucrative. Uh, art history kind of transitioned into fashion very quickly when I moved to New York, um, kind of fell in love with the city and, and all that it can inspire through music, fashion, art. Um, and became an intern, really, and, and, and learned underneath a woman who at the time was um, LeBron James stylist. I had no idea what a stylist was, no concept of the business of fashion, and really kind of did all of the grunt work for <laughs> probably way too long, mm -hmm. um, and kind of knew that from there on, I would I would kind of move on to do my own thing. I never thought I would come to Los Angeles to do it. I always thought I would be an East Coast girl. Mm -hmm. um, but it's crazy because it wasn't like, now I have a business. It was sort of like, this is what I'm doing and I love to do it. And it was, I guess, not a hobby because I was getting paid, but it was, um, I was working frequently to try to figure out what the business meant. And I think it took a long time um, even after having my own clients to really hone down. Okay, so now I need to set up what this looks like. Um, and and it, I almost worked retroactively. And so I think a lot of times people, because I work in a creative field, don't realize that it, there is actually a business structure around it. Um, but it did, it, it wasn't a, a it wasn't an innate thing for me. I was like, this is great. I'm dressing people. I'm working with celebrities. I'm sort of living this, you know, dream life. Um, and it wasn't until I moved to Los Angeles, that I said, you know what, let's, let's get this, let's get an accountant. Let's, you know, do all the things to make sure that I'm doing the right things. Great. Um, Alex, I know you've had a number of different, um, you know, careers, what for you, um, you know, what was the point where you thought, I'm, I'm going to sit down and write this book? Um, the catalyst really for me was I, you know, I was working as a reporter um, for five years for NPR and I had a journalism background and I had also been, you know, I'm a creative. I had been an actress and comedian and whatnot in New York for like eight years, but I got pregnant and I was like sitting there and I was like, and I was so <laughs> like read, I read Nantucket Nights by Ellen Hildebrand. I remember thinking I, I could write a book like this and I really love this book. So I joined the um, Cape Cod Writers Center. I was living on the Cape and um, I met, so I met a couple women there who like we formed our own offshoot group and we just decided to meet every two weeks and exchange pages and be held accountable. And that was like a major thing towards getting it done. Um, and particularly with this last book, um, my shameless plug, friends with both, um, every two weeks we would meet and exchange 10 pages. So you had somebody else's eyes on your work. Otherwise, you know, it's probably just work in a vacuum and you had to be held accountable, you know? So the, the catalyst really was just um, sort of a life change of, of having a, a baby or something <laughs> or yeah. something. 
Um, Tyler, what about you? What what was that point where you decided you were going to do something for yourself? It started, uh, I'd say, when I was 28 and had um, finished college as a uh, graphic design was my trade. And uh, I realized that I did not have the um, patience to sit in an office uh, day in and day out uh, and have a routine. I'm uh, also a creative and need um, things to be different every day. So I ventured out at that point and started my own graphic design business. And then uh, probably because I had undiagnosed ADD, uh, who knows? Um, I've had various career paths um, from theater set designer to owning a marketing firm to, you know, a, a wide variety of, uh, of creative jobs that was a winding path towards what I ultimately love to do. And um, so that's that's where I'm at right now. And it took me, I don't know, I'm, I'll be 67 and August. So it took me a long time to get there, but I'm at my happiest point in my, my life. Reem, uh, you as well started off in a, in a, you know, an artistic field. Um, what, what was, what was the thing that made you decide you, you know, wanted to start your own business? Um, yeah, well, I'm probably similar to Courtney and Tyler in some ways. Um, when I graduated HB in 84, um, I wanted to study art and my mom said, you're too smart for art because I, <laughs> you know, I was in all the AP classes and, um, you know, math, higher math and all that stuff. So I did go into engineering and, um, and then made a quick shift to art because I just, you know, was not, wasn't my thing. So, um, and then I uh, took on various odd jobs uh, when I moved out here to California, got my master's and I was working as a substitute teacher um, and driving home. I don't know if you know this, the Bay Area, but it's a lot of traffic and everything and was very frustrated. So frustration really took me to that point. And um, I had had a lot of ideas of different businesses to create. So again, a lot of kind of creative ideation and decided to uh, choose this tea that we import, that we uh, drank when we were children from Iraq, where I'm from, uh, called Numi. And, um, and that's what started it. And my brother and I kind of synchronistically met up and decided to do it together. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I kind of listened to a couple points of advice that was in my head. One was from a boyfriend who had said, just grind your teeth and do it, meaning get over whatever fear you have. And the other was from my father who used to tell me, just choose one thing and master that thing. Um, you know, similarly interested in everything. So at that point in my life, so um, when I was around 30, so it's been 26 years of, or 23 years of starting the business. Right. It's, it sounds like um, one of the themes I'm hearing is everybody kind of came from a creative background. Maybe that helped sort of think outside the box and, you know, think more, maybe I don't want to just do this one thing forever. I want to do, you know, my own business where I can take it in the direction I want to take it. Um, thank you. So my next question is, um, what was your first step in your entrepreneurial uh, journey? And what were some key milestones in building your businesses? Um, Alex, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, I would say my first step in terms of being an author was um, was joining the, the writer's group or finding somebody to you know hold me accountable for my pages. So that was really a first step. So I'm sure there's a writer's center for anybody out there or, um, like in Boston, there's Grub Street here, and you can just join a group and hold yourself accountable. I would say the milestones were, um, and a life lesson that they always say is don't ever publish your first book. And I mm. <laughs> had a first book, which is like, I cringe now and like want to eradicate it from the universe. But <laughs> so you do that, you vomit out like some words and you're like, this is so good. And then it's like, really not. But I mean, it might be a little bit there's, you know, but so, you know, you have to just keep writing and keep going, I guess. And then now I um, circled back, I wrote another book and then I, uh, the 
I would say the milestone was getting a publisher. Um, and that took some time. I had to send query letters and um, submissions for probably like seven months. You have to take a lot of no's to get to a yes. Um, but I did, I, I got like 32 no's and then I got a yes. So that's not bad. Like Jennifer Weiner got like 189 no's and one year and then went back and said to the same people and she got one yes. And now she's like this prolific, amazing author. So sure. you just have to be tenacious. Sure. Um, Tyler, what about you? Um, what were the, the milestones for you? Uh, I'd say, uh, from the staging business into, um, working basically for myself. And then I had four storage units filled with furniture. And at one point my mover said, you need a warehouse. And <laughs> so I went from four storage units to 6,000 square foot warehouse and uh, staging up to 20 properties at a time, anywhere from 2,500 square feet to 14,000 square feet houses. So that was where you then got, <laughs> got uh, all the the large net to cover, you know, insurance and rent and liability and um, employees and payroll. And so it was, it, that was pretty major step for me. Um, so that was probably the, the catalyst that was, that drove me to the higher, um, anyway, the, the bigger business picture. Um. Reem, you mentioned that you, you know, you had some frustration in that initially, but um, at what point did you have an idea and decide that we're, I'm going to, I'm going to go with this one. Um, and then what were those, what were the milestones for your, for new me tea? Well, I mean, that, that, that moment of frustration kind of told me, led me to the idea. And then I decided to stick to that idea. Um, of course, having my brother alongside me is super helpful to have a partner. Um, the milestones I would say were um, securing an angel investor at first uh, to help us fund the business and um, probably, um, you know, reaching the 1 million mark was a good milestone and um, gaining distribution across the country um, in, you know, most of the natural food and the groceries, a lot of the grocery stores, those were um, big milestones. And, you know, we've moved to different offices and warehouses along the way, um, you know, getting 30 some employees was a good milestone as well. So I, I just, it's every, every year is different and every kind of hurdle is a different one. So hard to say. Um, Courtney, what about you? Um... What, what point when you were working for, I guess, Tracy Reese, um, when did you decide, what was the thing that made you say, I'm out, I'm going to go do this on my own? And then yeah, there was a girl that worked in the store with me that um, was an intern for the woman who I eventually ended up working for. And she complained and she gave all of these very Devil Wears Prada examples of how terrible her life was. Um, and for whatever reason, I said, I want to do that. Um, and I kind of took that risk. I put, I sent my resume in that next day and the following day I was an intern. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that was a huge milestone, really finding someone that did what I thought I wanted to do and staying under her wing and, and asking all of the questions and doing all of the hard work and, and making sure that I was you know, the best mentee and learning as much as possible from her. I think the next big milestone was when I moved to Los Angeles, when I moved to Los Angeles is I got an agent, which was crazy to me. Like the fact that I say I have an agent sounds very insane. <laughs> um, but I think it really helped to market myself. I spent a lot of time in, in theory, what I do is a service position. And so my job is to make other people look great and really develop their image surrounding whatever business they are in. But um, working alongside an agency really helped to remind me that um, I too am a thought leader in this space and that it's important for me to vocalize that and share that with the world. And so I think that's really helped me to 
grow my business as well as put myself out there in the world. And so those were kind of my two. And obviously there are certain moments with clients that I'm like, you know, that really kind of launched me into a, a new direction. But I think business-wise, those were the two big ones. So, you know, you mentioned getting an agent and that that was pretty key in, um, you know, in terms of like a resource for you and in, in growing your business. Is there, you know, what are the other, are there like professional groups or other um, networking opportunities or other things that you feel were critical to sort of establishing and then growing your, your business? Yeah, it's, it's crazy because now with social media, I think people can sort of lean into um, you know, who, you know who Rachel Zoe is, you know, maybe you know who Law Roach is, you, you're, you have more access to people who are doing what I do. I think when I first started, there was no, I think Facebook was just a thing. Um, and so it was really about um, being active in the community that I was in. So talking to the other interns, working with the other assistants, making sure I was kind of always available to do all of the, the nonsense work that no one wanted to do, just making sure you're putting yourself out there. There wasn't really like a, a styling group or a entre it was sort of a trial and error situation. You know, I didn't know that this would turn into a business. Um, I think now I'm really, active and making sure that I um, stay in contact with my peers. So other people that I admire in the business, I'm making sure I'm reaching out. Um, people who say, hey, I love what you're doing. I'd love to ask you questions. I try my best to you know, be there to, to answer those questions and making sure that there is a community around what I'm doing. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of competition in, in the world that I'm in, but I think that my goal is that if we continue to have conversations about business and we can help each other, you know, how did you invoice for this? Or how did you get this client? Or how did you even get an agent? Then, then those groups can sort of be established and, and we can have a community around, you know, creative business. Sure. Um, Tyler, what about you? Were there, um, you know, particular resources that were really important to developing your business? Not, not really. Um, the, <laughs> the staging business was pretty sort of very competitive and um, sort of, uh, I don't know, solitary for me anyway. Um, but uh, I would also reach out to other um, stagers that if they had questions and I was always willing to share information just because I think that's how you grow your business and um, giving back to your community. Um, but I was never a part of a, the staging designer group. Um, I, I think it's just part of my personality, um, but giving back is important as well. So that was... Um, I think something that's so important, I think for all of us probably in, in business is that is the marketing component and touching on what like Courtney said and Reem, everyone, and um, is that you really have to, even if you're creative, you really have to have sort of a business acumen and you have to have um, a marketing skill set or, you know, in terms of now you have to be present on social media and you have to almost like do your own public relations. Like, you know, and a lot of people, I think sometimes, particularly when you're in creative, like if writers, for example, are often like, ah, like, I don't want to put myself out there. I'm going to hide behind my book, but you have to like be sort of shameless in terms of your own promotion. And I think if you, you have to do that yourself often, particularly when you're starting out, um, you have to just sort of like market yourself everywhere um, and reach out to different people and network and build relationships and call the newspaper and be like, hey, I wrote this book or hey, I have this business. You just have to be like very persistent. And I think that's something that's important to know until you have a team behind you and you start by yourself, you really have to be willing to put in the time to market yourself because otherwise it's just, you're in a vacuum and nobody's going to, nobody's going to yeah. hear you or see you. You are, you, you're wearing a lot of different hats when you yeah. own your own business. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. But you're the intern, you're the, you're getting the copy, you're doing all the admin, you're doing the invoicing, you're doing the marketing, yeah. your HR, your, your everything. everything. Yeah. 
um, it sounds like, you know, Courtney, you mentioned and, and Alex too, that you kind of reached out to other people that were doing what you thought you wanted to do to ask questions and, and that sort of helped you through that. Um, Reem, do you have anything like that? I mean, how, how did you know what the next step was in terms of, I have this, you know, idea with the T and like, how do I source it? How do I, you know, where, where, what resources did you use to actually, um, you know, go from the idea to the actual implement implementation of like a business? Yeah, I, we, I mean, we asked a lot of questions. I think when, if you're a person who um, doesn't have a business background, like myself, my brother, uh, we just became sponges for information. So we'd ask anybody and everybody that we would come across that knew something about the natural food world or, you know, manufacturing. Um, I remember the first call I had with our tea bag supplier. I was on that call for about an hour and a half, just asking questions and questions. Um, back in that day, I opened up the yellow pages and went through every single um, box manufacturing uh, packaging uh, supplier there was and called them. And, you know, passion, curiosity, um, you know, detail, uh, all of the skills that you are required to have while you're running your business, you need to have before. So um, organization, um, you know, just friendliness, uh, optimism. Um, so they're just at play. And I would add too, is that um, we, uh, you know, a lot of people think having your own business is really luxurious and like, you know, you're just sitting back and kind of watching the money roll in. <laughs> it's not, it's hard work, you know, it's 12, 16 hour days for years and years and years, no vacation, um, you know, just getting what you can to get by to pay the rent. Um, so it takes a long, I mean, some businesses are, you know, overnight successes, but it takes, takes a long time to kind of establish yourself, get out there, you know, dial for dollars, knock on doors, travel. We traveled to 14 trade shows in our first year in business. So just, you know, traveling salespeople, obviously, depending on what, what you're doing um, in terms of your business, but it's a lot of hard work. Uh, um, but there's also, there's also luck and serendipity and winging it, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> trusting your gut. Yeah. Um, I know, Reem, you'd mention one of the big milestones uh, or key things to starting the business was um, securing an angel investor. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask the rest of you, you know, how, how did you secure funding if you needed it? Um, did you have another job for a while while you could get enough startup money to do um you know, to write your book or to become a stylist or open up your shop? Um, you know, how, how, what role did the funding play? Uh, I'll start. I, I, I was lucky enough that I never had to look for funding. Um, I think I was able to uh, make in incremental steps based on uh, what I um, could base, you know, the income on. And it was just very calculated, but uh, but also risk-taking at the same time. And I'm telling you, there were many sleepless nights thinking uh, when's the next, you know, job coming in. Um, so you're, you just have to put yourself out there um, and you're only as good as your last job. And so thankfully it sustained us in the staging business, I keep, go, keep, keep talking about my staging business, but it was a, a natural progression from my staging business to the retail shop. So um, it built the whole basis of all of it. But uh, it, it, um, I think it's knowing what your limits are and not going over them so that you don't have to go out and look for funding. But for some, you have to. I think for, for me, um, it was, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to remember, like, you know, a lot of times you could pursue your, you know, you have a vocation while you pursue your avocation. And so I think particularly it was with some creative things too, like, um, 
I worked for 20 years, you know, and other things, obviously, based on what you, how you introduced me. But um, so I think in the last, you know, 10 years or so, I would say while I was writing, I was also raising kids and working as a single mom and like a brutal desk job. Like I literally was like a clock watcher um, in a cubicle and I saved a lot of money. So I didn't have an investor, but I think that you know, while you're working, doing these things on the side or your passion project, I think to have another job and to gradually save is an important thing because then I was able to now pay for um, editing and things like that, that need, you know, you have to put in the money um, ahead of time if you don't have like a, a financial agent or something. Um, so, and I, you know, you can do other, like I sold my house. <laughs> I had extra money from that. You know, there's always, there's creative ways that you can come up with your, your money. <laughs> um, Courtney, what about you? Yeah, I didn't, um, for what I do, I didn't need an investor. I mean, at the start, now I'm actually looking for an investor because I'm starting something else. But I, um, I think my thought here is that it wasn't a need for an investor, but it was a need for like financial understanding. So understanding like how to work budgets and, and I'm working with other people's money too. So making sure like I'm accounting for every dollar that goes in and out. Um, and, and understanding like the value of time when it comes to money, because when you're, you're working for yourself, you're constantly working. So you, not knowing like how to pay yourself and all of those things were things I kind of had to teach myself because like some of the other women, I didn't have a, a business background. So no, didn't need an investor because I wasn't starting something that was a tangible product, um, but really had to kind of relearn finance in a way and accounting just so that I could be on top of what I need to do for my clients. Yeah. Um, Alex, you had mentioned sending out your um, book to a bunch of publishers before you finally got that yes. Um, that you know must have been frustrating. How did you keep yourself motivated? And you know, when things got challenging, how did you stay optimistic about what your what your goal was? Um, I would say it was a combination of. Um, you know, continuing to read, or if you're in another industry, considering to surround yourself with people who are sort of inspiring. So if I would just continue to read books that I was inspired by, I was like, okay, I can get there. You know, you also have to have a really thick skin in terms, I'm actually like a super sensitive person, but for some reason, I just let the nose roll off. Like, I just don't, I was like, oh, well, and then it was important to also, um, yeah, surround yourself with positive people, not talk to yourself terribly. I know we all do, but, and just be like your own <laughs> champion and realize, and we, I guess also looking at, I think this is important if you find just like a mentor, somebody who you want to, if uh, their career that you want. And like, I would go and check other authors and read their story. Like I said, Jennifer Weiner, and like, you'd realize that everybody had a struggle. Everybody it took a lot of no's before a yes. And so that would sort of make me feel better and keep me going, just recognizing, you know, that other people were in the same boat, so. Sure. Um, Reem, what about you? Um, you know, it, when when the hard times came, what, it, what kept you going? Um, I think, I mean, you know, there's been, there was the 2008 recession, and then there was COVID. <laughs> so there's been a lot of hard times. Um, we, you know, we have a very supportive, uh, we have a great team, firstly, and um, we're very open and transparent and talk things out and through, and especially our exec team. So the, our team, you know, my team members kind of keep, keep me going in that sense um, because they all are committed and, and uh, dedicated and want this company to succeed. So we work that way. Uh, we work smart to cut costs when we need to cut costs. Um, and I think that the belief in the brand, you know, the belief in what you're doing and when that starts to slip, 
then you really got you really have nothing in a sense because if you believe in your product or your brand or your service and know that you're offering something that doesn't exist in the market or it's something that's really special um and you, you have values to support it and you know the, the proof is in the pudding in that sense um then you just keep going because you really don't have a choice in a sense like what else are you going to do you know so you, you you're invested so once you're invested and you believe in it then you just keep going and you try and make it work um I would say that and then I would say also our consumers because we get so many positive we get so much positive feedback um around our product that we, it makes you feel like it's got to keep how to keep being on the shelf so uh you're going to do whatever you can to do that um, Tyler, do you have any anything that that sort of assuaged your fears? You mentioned some sleepless nights thinking about the next job. Um, what what motivated you, or you know, kept kept you optimistic? Well, I'm going to switch over now to my the shop, um, which we've only had open for a year and a half. Um, but uh, I'd say the feedback you get, as Reem was talking about, from your clients. Um, when they come in and find that perfect piece that um, you've worked so hard on, uh, refurbishing and saving from the landfill, uh, and they ha they have a perfect spot for it in their house, it's just it just makes you so happy. Um, and the other inspiration we find is just uh, going to the fabric store. It's, it sounds so silly, but and finding that perfect piece of fabric that you that you want to cover a chair in or um you know celebrating um successes with your colleagues um when we have networking um events at our shop uh it's so inspiring to have those other women around um talking about their creative endeavors and uh, and it, it just is uplifting so um there's a lot of little things that you can find inspiration in so and i know that all of you um you know have some aspect of your business that, that uh, involves philanthropy um and bringing awareness to different social issues um reem can you talk about um you know your your new me foundation and some of the work you do and do you feel like that was important um to the actual success of of your business having that um philanthropic part of the business um i'm not sure it it was um you know part and parcel to the success of the business but i do think it 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 um it, it's an extension of the aura of the brand. So if the brand is successful because of all the different ways, all of the sort of environmental sustainability and then the you know social responsibility, um, then yes, I would say yes. But then we didn't start with the NUMI Foundation. We um, started the foundation about 10 years ago. And our original idea was to do some things in Iraq because of our birth country and all the wars um, that have ravaged the country. So, but it was very difficult because it was sort of, you know, uh, just too much going on there uh, to be able to find, find ways in. And what we started with was to think about um, something that made sense for us as a tea company and, uh, that was cause related and uh, came up with the idea of water because you can't have tea without clean, safe drinking water and almost a billion people on the planet um, don't have access to that. So that was our first initiative. And uh, we were just happened to be getting uh, tea from Madagascar, which is ninth poorest country in the world. Um, and those farmers who are in very remote areas uh, were getting collecting their water from the, from the, um, from the dirty rivers, you know, that animals defecate in and people go to the bathroom in, so, and lots of diseases. So um, we immediately saw that as our first project. We raised um, about $100,000 in a couple months and uh, built 
uh, 24 wells in those villages. And I went to visit those villages and they had basically gotten clean water for the first time in their life, which was really amazing and humbling for us to be able to do that. And that was about 3000 farmer families. And then we took the same project to India and impacted them. So it was kind of a, a really um, vertical approach to be able to kind of come full circle from our farming communities to selling the product and people enjoying the tea. So that, that's been a big initiative for us. Uh, we last year um, raised funds to help uh, uh, internally displaced Ukrainians, about 80,000 internally displaced Ukrainians with water filters because of the Russian invasion there. And so that was a big project. Um, COVID was also something we pivoted into because uh, so many people were uh, not able to go to food banks and things. So we delivered fresh produce from restaurant, from farmers that were not able to deliver to restaurants. So organic produce to, um, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of pounds of fresh produce to inner city communities. Um, and then we also created a, um, a curriculum called NUMI, Nature Underlies My Inspiration, and it's providing gardening curriculum to um, underserved communities in the Bay Area. So that served um, thousands of students. So, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where once you start, you don't stop because you feel like it's a great benefit. And we have an executive director who helps raise funds. And we also donate some, some proceeds from the ink side of the business as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's amazing. Um, Courtney, um, I know that you are really passionate about, you know, your some social issues and small uh, black owned businesses. How do you use your business to sort of leverage um, and 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 bring awareness to some of those things that you're passionate about? Yeah, so um, what I do is address celebrities and they are able to use a, their platform to speak to larger issues. And so I think a couple years ago, I decided that um, we could use fashion to have those conversations. And that's actually what reinvigorated me to continue to do what I was doing. Cause I, I no longer was interested in, you know, trying to be a part of the luxury fashion world. I, it, I thought it was silly to inspire people to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on material items. Um, but what I did, um, I work for a uh, basketball player, Chris Paul, he plays for the Phoenix Suns. At the time, he was playing for the Houston Rockets. And my dad went to a historically black college. He went to Texas Southern University. And I was there um, working with Chris and I wanted to go on campus to get my dad an alumni sweatshirt. And so my partner and I went on campus. We were so excited sending my dad photos. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if Chris wore a SWAT shirt from the school and supported this local um, HBCU? And so that sort of opened the conversation with my client. Hey, how can we use this tunnel walk, which is becoming sort of synonymous with the game watching experience as the guys enter the arena or they're getting off the plane and, and people are starting to pay more attention to what they have on, not just you know how they're playing in the game, um, as a moment to champion something that we don't necessarily talk about or champion a cause that needs attention. And so we use that entire season um, and thereafter to wear, college apparel, but all from HBCUs. And so every game he wore something from one of the 108 HBCUs in the country. Um, and it became a really huge part of the NBA. The next year, they um, the NBA All-Star Game was, the theme was historically black colleges and universities. They had a marching band. They sung the African-American national anthem. It became a huge part of NBA culture. And I think we were able to um, bring awareness to those schools that would not have had otherwise um, to a point where other athletes were donating to the school. Some were um, you know, attending the schools post their career. Um, and so that became a really cool way for me to say, you know what? like 
getting up and giving a speech about how we should support these colleges is probably not as effective as like, let me put on a cool sweatshirt or a cool hoodie um, and, and style in a way that becomes recognizable. Um, and so that was kind of my way of using fashion as a platform to, to speak to something that was important um, for me. Also, I think just my presence alone and kind of being um, a little bit more out there in the world. I'm a six foot plus size woman working in the fashion world. And there's not a lot of people that look like me in this community. And so I, I try to, or I have been trying to make sure that I'm sort of out and proud and, and showing that you can be, you know, black, female, plus size, queer woman that can work in the fashion world and have, you know, an opinion and, and be a thought leader in the menswear space and actually know what you're doing and know what you're talking about. Um, and so I guess in, in my own small way, that's my sort of activism. Um, and then also just in a general way, I constant, constantly am trying to make sure that we're actually spending our money with small businesses and, and putting our, our dollars there and not just, you know, buying from the larger luxury brands, but making sure we're, we're finding and seeking out, you know, new companies and, and smaller companies, black owned companies, female owned companies to make sure that we're actually um, supporting them, not just asking for free clothes so, so that they can get the publicity, but actually buying them. And so um, that's been really important to me. And I try to do that with all of my clients, as well as find ways that for Chris, it was HBCUs, for other clients, it's sustainability. Some people, it's mental health. Kevin Love is a huge mental health advocate. And so we try to use fashion to kind of talk about the things that they're interested in in their philanthropy as well. That's great. Yeah. Um, we have about four more minutes left. So um, before we leave um i'd love to hear from each one of you just you know what's your number one piece of advice um to anybody looking to start their own business um alex do you want to start i'm sorry um did you ask me a key piece of advice to start your own business yes um i guess my key piece of advice would be uh, just to get going, like stop, 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 um, procrastinating and just put your, just throw yourself out there. I love saying jump and the net will appear. Um, I'm kind of like Tigger, like if you fall, you just bounce back, you know, and there's nothing bad about putting yourself out there and there's enough room for everybody. There's the, the talent isn't saturated. And so don't say, Oh, that's already been done. Find what makes you different, how you can tell that story differently. And, um, just, just start and then you, and you'll find little successes and then just keep going. Great. Tyler, what about you? Uh, probably a couple things. Um, uh, focus on what you love. Try not to be all things to all people um, mm -hmm. and turn failure around into successes. So look for the silver lining in everything. Sure. Reem? Yeah. Um, to add, I would say, um, you know, grit, make sure just you have grit and uh, and to persevere any fears that come up, fears will come up naturally and uh, take it as a way to learn and grow as a person. Um, and you don't really, you don't know it all. So you, there's a, a business is a mixture of natural instinct and passion of, for your own. And also listening to other people because people have done it, know it, uh, have a different opinion. So be open and inclusive to, um, you know, other other thoughts and uh, ideas from others. Courtney, what about you? I, I don't know. I echo everyone's sentiment. I think, you know, grit is important. Staying curious is important. Um, stop procrastinating, just do it, take risks. I think those are all very key into how I kind of got to where I am. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies. This was so interesting. And um, if, if anybody else has any questions, um, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? 
No, I know we're right. We're right at one o'clock. I'm just so grateful for this conversation and for everybody joining today. We hope this is one of many. We're looking for ways to inspire each other and connect with each other. So if you have ideas, want to present something, want to talk about something with the alumni group, let us know. Uh, we cannot wait to do more of this. I'm just so grateful for all of these stories, you all. I'm so pumped. I'm like, I have started business <laughs> tomorrow. I'm pumped up. So thank you all. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Oh, yes. And don't forget about um, Alexandra Speck's book. Um, friends available May 30th, local bookstores, um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere you get your reading. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.